Hello and welcome to the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WOZO Radio 103.9 LPFM right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. I'm DJ Doubter 5 and we're recording this on Sunday morning, June 25th, 2023. As usual, we have our co-host Wombat on the line with us. Hello, Wombat. I'm the Wombat. I got ants. You got ants. It is what it is. I'm going to clean up. (laughs) And we also have as a special guest, uh, Boudreaux from Kentucky. Is that correct? Yep. What's up, fellas? Yep. Digital Free Thought Radio Hour is a talk radio show about atheism, free thought, rational thought, humanism, and the sciences. Conversely, we'll also talk about religion, religious faith, gods, holy books, and superstition. And if you get the feeling that you're the only non-believer in your town, well, you're just not. I guarantee it. Here in Knoxville, in the middle of the Bible Belt, we have a group of over a thousand of us. We're the Atheist Society of Knoxville, or ASK, and we'll tell you more about us after the mid-show break. Be sure to stick around. Wombat, what's our topic today? Why can't we testify in court? And basically, uh, the history of religion and atheism when it comes to litigation and serving ourselves in our judicial circles. But before we get into that, I'd like to do a quick little roundup, see how everybody's doing. And then we go into the meat and potatoes of the show. Boo Joe, we start with you. How you been, my friend? I've been good. Uh, I've been working hard to rearrange my schedule to make sure I can get on more calls. So nice. Um, nice. I'm trying to do that. I've got a uh, well, orange theory. I can see that, but uh, Pretty cool. I usually do that Sunday mornings, but now I've kind of moved it to Sunday at noon. So that I want to check in with you. Out. I'm checking in with you too. How's your enterprise of selling Star Wars toys and disc golf discs going? <laughs> Man, I, I don't think I have the patience. I, I, I try to put stuff out there and it just nothing. And so I think I still have, some, I have something on there that's just one of those eBay and definite just sits there and it gets nothing. So I'll, I'll wait. I don't know. You ever thought of sweetening the pot and just making it like cheaper so you could just get rid of the stuff? Yeah, I have. Okay. But you're just like, nah, at this point, it's not <laughs> sentimental. I might as well just keep it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I know this is a conversation with you and your wife like all the time. So like, okay. I don't want to cry. I don't want to cry. <laughs> no, it really isn't a conversation all the time. But <laughs> <laughs> you okay. and my wife might have that conversation all the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I've been doing pretty good. I've been doing some car repair. But more importantly, more interestingly, uh, commercials come out from my company where I'm the star of it. Um, they did a whole filming session at my job. Um, just used me as a talent and we got to do a bunch of walkthrough a lot of b-rolls we got to go to a local school where we do some volunteer work get some shots of me talking to the kids and then going out to a disc golf course and doing some shots over there it was really fun and the final commercial came out felt really good made me feel really special um end of the fiscal year is this month and in july is when it will be released so i'll be happy to share it with everybody once it's out but So far, really happy just to get some. uh, It feels good to be in a place where you feel recognized and and appreciated. That's all I can say. Cool. And, and, uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Larry, what's up with you? Don't just tell me motorcycles and video games, or I'll be really jealous. Motorcycles and video games. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Matter of fact, there's no motorcycles this week. It's been raining all week. Only the 15 year old you could meet the, 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 the 80 year how 70 how old are 73 73 year old version yeah. of you now. you're just like what do you do you're old it's like no nah, video games and motorcycles like oh i yeah. can't wait till i get old that's yeah. awesome do i still yeah, have to go to school it's like eh. uh, <laughs> you have to work though i still work <laughs> you still have to work yeah. okay uh larry would you mind introducing the topic oh yeah well it the way i have it down is why why don't we argue religion in court um, you know, uh, we go to courts to determine truth, you know, about matters, uh, legal and otherwise. Um, but we never bring religion into court. I mean, other than maybe swearing on the Bible, but lately people have been swearing on all kinds of books that, that they have not uh, held that a Bible had to be used. Mm. Uh, matter of fact, a lot of times it makes no sense. Why would I go to court and swear in a Bible? Right. Uh, so, uh, just why don't we go to court with these religious claims and try to determine the truth of them? We, I think we have in some examples, but uh, before we get into more specifics, Eric, do you have ideas of like why, um, 
why there's so much religious pageantry around the legal system, you know, like swearing on Bibles, um, taking oaths, uh, the idea that, you know, you could be a Hindu and you show up at an American court and you're like, uh, can I get a different book? And it's like, oh, we, that we don't do that here, sir. Like, this is the brand. Yeah. And God, we trust on the back of like books and, and the way how we refer to like certain judges and stuff like that. Uh, any ideas? On I, that? I'd have to say the old, uh, the only game in town, you know, uh, we've said the same thing about, you know, even universities and some some older you know academics were rooted in religion because that was mm. the only game in town back then in many many years ago so it's kind of when you know courts were set up i imagine you know religion was just such an important part of it that you know it, it had to have a seat it had to have a uh a relationship but i'm but i'm with larry though i'm 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 kind of scratching my head now thinking you know we've got some big debates big questions why can't we put those into the, the court of law system and and uh and and handle it that way you know like have someone make an argument for some religious claim and say objection mm -hmm. <laughs> you know yeah, where's your evidence evidence. god yeah. told me to do it yeah so, well the thing about it is a uh, long time ago uh, a couple hundred years ago we used to allow Yep. what they used to call spectral evidence sure did and of course that led to uh, witch trials and mm. burnings at the stake things like that until uh yep. they finally put i think it was governor higgs if i remember the name correctly uh put an end to it uh, saying you know there's nothing to really back these up anybody can make a claim sure and, but i mean you know unless you can back it up with evidence then why believe the claim hmm I want to throw out, somebody's life is at stake. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So we know like witch trials, but like that's going on today. Like if you look at honor killings going on in Middle East, like uh -huh. these are people who are using religious grounds to hurt and harm people needlessly. And I find mm -hmm. that to be really disgusting. You know, uh, I didn't like it back then. I don't like it now. I wish we could just take it to court and be like, hey, everybody, this is our new standard of evidence. Let's just, you know, this is going to be in benefit for everybody. Whereas otherwise we're like stuck to listening to other people's agendas. I, uh, Boudreaux, how do you feel about medieval Europe? Remember Knights? You're a Star Wars buff. You know, like Knights and stuff like that. Um, sure. Medieval Europe, Star Wars, I feel like there's some sort of parallels there. But I, I also find that for medieval Europe, it was heavily, or like the most powers that would be were, you know, predominantly Christian. And the... And let me know if this is fair. I'd love to hear if this is fair interpretation. But it court uh, cases or matters of the truth were not based on science, but were handled by the church, right? And yeah. so in a lot of cases, if you didn't conform to the Christian faith, such as if you were a Jew or a Muslim, you might be excluded from testifying in court altogether. And your testimony- yeah. Or atheist. Oh, oh, that's that's right, death especially right no, that's just an immediate death sentence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you're a Jew, they'd be like, we'll go to war with you, but we're almost we're not as bad as those heathens over there. Anyway, uh, the idea would be like if you're if you're a Christian, you have like an extra advantage in testifying in court because you have a credible, you would be seen as more credible. But if you're Jewish or you're Muslim and you're trying to testify, especially in a European stage, you'd have a, a much harder time off. And that times I find that to be, let me know if that's fair. I find that to be uh, a way to keep people in your faith, particularly yeah. if you're in that circle. Because if you're not, and someone says, oh, his land is my land. It's like, that's not true. This has always been my land. It's like, no, this guy is not even a Christian. Look at him. Look at him. He's <laughs> he, he's undeserving. God told me that this was hit my land. He's like, ah, oh, dang, they're doing the God angle. Dang it. How's, yeah. how's that evidence? Yeah, it, God it, yeah. in his role as the real estate agent. Mm. What do you guys think? It, Is that fair? It's kind of like uh, middle school, kind of like the cool kids. It's kind of like, you know, if if uh, you get into a, 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 there's a, there's a group of people that everybody kind of mysteriously, even maybe subconsciously decided that they're all the cool ones. And if you're not, you know, part of their team, part of their, their party and whatever else, yeah, you're, you're. You're one of the outcasts. Eric, Eric, we're delving into some personal things now. Who are the cool kids at your school? How are you not the cool kid? <laughs> Middle school, I feel like, uh, I don't know, I, was, I grew up in Wisconsin, and um, 
I, don't know, I was a skateboard punk kid. So you were a punk I was, kid. I was a punk. Yeah. The yeah. punk kids were the cool kids. I don't know. We were we were probably the outcasts. I think. Okay. Yeah. Depends on who the you punk ask. should be. There's no such thing as a mainstream <clears throat> punk kid back in like '80s right. or whatever you had it. That was like you were the. That's the. Yeah. They would make cartoons and movies out of you guys. That's right. what everyone aspires to be now. They want like, how can I be an outcast? What do I? Have, what hair do? What color do I have to dye my hair to stand out and be an outcast yep. now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you had long hair. You have you used to have like a crazy long mullet sort of thing going on too, right? Not a mullet, but I had the beautiful <laughs> long hair pulled it in a ponytail. Oh yeah yeah this guy didn't real so like in my head there's you go to school and you either don't find the cool kids which means you are the cool kid or mm -hmm. you know or you're you're with the cool kids and you realize ah those kids are much cooler I had a b advantage of when I was in high school of going to a lot of different schools and when one school I was misinterpreted as one of the cool kids and all the cool kids did was sit on a bleacher the entire lunch period and that's it and they barely uh even had like any meaningful small talk. And I'm like, this is boring. I would rather play yo-yos and basketball or Pokemon. You guys yeah. are wasting my time. I'm going to go hang out with the not so cool kids. And I had a lot more fun. And then overall, I felt like I was more cool just doing being myself. You know, like I said, it all depends on who you ask. Mm, you know, yeah. if, if you're a member of a, a group that's, you know, 50% of the class, you can just call yourself the cool kids and right. then cast out other people or, or judge other people. But I want to I want to pull this back to medieval Europe just real quick because I think it's a racket and I feel like that's how it set us up for today. It's essentially you if you're a, if you're in Muslim controlled territories and you go to court and you're a Christian, you're at a disadvantage, and that right. helps people in that area stay Muslim. If you're in a Jewish area and you're not and you're a Muslim, that's going to be a disadvantage. So it helps that 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 culture stay Jewish. And the same thing for Christianity. So if Christianity wins a bunch of wars. Yep. and just takes over the world then you have a bunch of people who have to conform for another reason to a particular dogmatic system not because it's true but just because it's the powers that be and i feel like that trickles down from europe trickles down to colonial america trickles down to english common law and all the way to modern society where you still have this effect of this large group saying if you want to be seen in front of your peers as a moral, upstanding person, because we have a monopoly on those things, credibility, loyalty, family values, morality, ethics, you have to be Christian. And you have to admit that you're Christian to everybody. And you have to swear on a Bible that you're Christian in front of anybody. Because the second you say that you don't conform to this religion, or you're not a part of our congregation, our culture, you're an outsider. And that's on a, with a peer of judges judging you, like a, peer, uh, a, a panel of your peers judging you. That puts you at a, I would say, uh, at a high stakes disadvantage when your welfare could be at stake. And I find that to be really unfortunate. Yeah, especially but, during the time of the Inquisition. Cool. And let's not forget that the Inquisition, Inquisition lasted 400 years and only mm -hmm. ended in the 1800s. Right. So it wasn't a long time ago. And I also say this too, uh, I brought up colonial America. There are there are instances where only approved denominations of Christianity were allowed to testify. And so oh, you could say, right. Hey, I'm a Christian. Well, so if you ask people in America now, like I'm a Christian, it's like, what do you mean by that? What that can mean, that can mean so many different things. Like I'm non-denominational. That's typically the, maybe sometimes the follow-up answer or I'm a third street Baptist, blah, 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 blah. But you know, I take a little bit of this and that and my wife's X, Y, Z is like, you had back at, back in colonial America, you had to be very specific brands of Christianity or nothing was allowed. And then there was like a very set list. And so it was less bifurcated as it was. And they were today. Uh, divided by regions and really mm -hmm. and areas, you know. Right. And, and leaders intermarry. No, right? probably not. No, no. And so, yeah, um, in Tennessee, we have a little bit of that now. There's um, Church of Christ, which sounds like it's uh, just a regular church, but it's actually a straight up very strict idea of what christianity is and is not like a non-interventionist god there's no holy spirit talking to you you can't do xyz you have to marry within the church it's very interesting and some of my friends who we've had talks with have come out of that religion and realized how bizarre that there were different versions of christianity that they were never exposed to because for them you were either in the church or you weren't in the church in the information bubble as it were right 
and there was no such thing as other Christians. Like this was the group who was going to heaven and not. And I'm like, you're, you had the internet, you had so much accessible to you and you didn't even know that. So imagine someone like that going to a, a, like get in a car accident <laughs> or a, a bumper and they go to, they go to court and they're like, do you swear on blah, blah, blah. It's like, which Bible is that? <laughs> yeah. Or we I've don't never... swear. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. We, one, we yeah. don't swear. And two, that's not my Bible. What, what is mm -hmm. this? Who are you guys? This is very bizarre. I've only talked to people who agree with me since I was born. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, um, up until 19th century uh, for English common law, that's what we're, that's what we're improving upon even today. Uh, you have to take an oath before you testify in court. And that was up to the 19th century. Now you don't have to. Now you can just give a, a firm. A right. Yeah. But it's different for every state. And some states try to sneak in more God stuff. Let me guess, the Southern ones. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so you can look at some of the oaths that are like in California. And of course, they're, I would say California has probably the best one because it's just like, yeah, I will I will tell the truth. I swear to it, blah, blah, blah. But in Tennessee, there's like some, it's like a long preamble and there's some stuff they sneak in or... And I'll pull it up in the second half of the show if anyone's interested in, but more than likely you can check it out yourself. Um, your your edicts for uh, uh, swearing oaths in court just vary from state to state, even to the point where even if I had to give that oath, I'd be like, listen, I'm an atheist. I don't want to say that. And they'll be like, aha, you're an atheist. Therefore, we know you're not telling the truth. And I'm just like, well, if it's that's the case, then how do you know I'm an atheist? Because you said so, but you know, I can't tell the truth. Yeah. Aha! I'm confused now. <laughs> Everyone's confused now. It's so bizarre. Eric, um, what do you what do you think about the idea of swearing on a Bible? If you had to do that, say you're in a you go back in time and you're like, hey, I'm just Eric from from the future. It's like you got to prove that. Swear on this Bible. What would you do? Well, I I wouldn't uh, give it any uh, credit for helping people tell the truth, but you have to you have to picture that you're. If you're on the stand and you put mm. your hand on the Bible and say something, you've got a jury of your peers. Right. And that jury of your peers is made up of people seemingly randomly selected. Right. And odds are half of them are or more. Um, well, let's maybe depending on where you live, um, they're more than likely going to be, you know, half or more religious, right? Especially right. in the South. So even so if you want to the question is do you want to um uh, uh make your point and make make a stand on the stand so to speak or do you want to have those people believe what you're saying and if it's the latter uh, you're you're better off just putting your hand on and lying and pretending like you, you believe right yeah larry well, what do you think larry I, well, I was just i, I, yeah, I was just i was just gonna say depending on how far back in time you're sending them it could be worth your life, whether or not you put your hand on the Bible and swear on it. Yeah, that, that, uh, is that was that what you're saying? I was going back in time to like the 1800s. Yeah, sure. Why not? Yeah. I mean, they'll be yeah, like, then, oh. yeah. The, I think I was reading that the first admitted atheist wasn't even until like the mid 1800s. Um, now, of course, it that's just the term. I mean, it, obviously, there have been atheist well before that but and then but but i think like the first like group i was just reading this uh, the other day so i think that's right like something like 1860s or something which is amazing <laughs> so yeah don't nobody's calling themselves an atheist anytime before that right yeah, yeah well that. um i think it was aristotle um was put to death on the charge of atheism but I really think it was more that he was just a troublemaker, and they said that he didn't believe in the gods that they believed in. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it goes all the way back all, over to them. And the mm -hmm. weird thing is, is he was tried yeah. by people who did believe in that system, including not just his peers, but like the authoritarians, the judges who, mm -hmm. who held those beliefs. And we have that same disadvantage even today because there are judges who, you know, might be very smart, very legal practice, but from since a young age, uh were operating under a deep cognitive bias that could be reinforced by mm -hmm. the fact that they are smart and they are capable but are operating under really poor dogmatic thinking when it regards yeah. to their religious belief and so they may harbor bias or by our prejudices against atheists and so when yeah. you say that in court the judge is like oh i don't like that i'm like you're supposed to be impartial come on dude <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what's going on yeah. larry what do you think 
Oh, I just wanted to correct myself before all of our uh, listeners corrected me. It wasn't Aristotle, it was Socrates. That's what I thought you were talking about. But Aristotle was so great. So great. So great. So Socrates. Okay. Can I can I turn the table then and ask either one of you today? You go into the court of law today hmm. and you're asked to swear on a Bible. You've got uh, a jury of your peers over there and you're really trying to convince them of something. Yeah. Do you risk it and do you say, ah, I'm an atheist, I don't want to do the Bible thing, or do you just play along? Yeah, because if I, I would I would admit it because I have so much media of me out here already admitting that I am, that I wouldn't want to set myself up for an easy trap saying, oh, he's just pretending yeah. he's godly because he's just trying to win your favor over. Like, I I can say, you know, it is what it is, but the less I try to hide something on a court stand, you know, mm -hmm. the better. And I, if I can just rely on my defense attorney to just say, hey, I'm going to be honest, and here's where I'm at, and this is the strategy that we come up with, I'm not going to try to set myself up to pretend to be someone I'm not. I think that could be easily something to take advantage of by like a prosecution team, particularly with- That, was the, yeah. that was the classic Good Sam, point. Harris, mm -hmm. Sam Harris answer right there, Ty. I got to- Oh, really? Oh, oh, yeah. You're still awake. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> you the same, Larry? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. And, I mean, I, I, you could trolley problem this thing up and down and, you know, make it to where it was, you know, a, a, a fringe case to where like sure. you know, the whole jury is is very clearly religious and and you're trying to you're trying to convince them that your best friend didn't murder someone or whatever. And uh, you have very flimsy defense and all that. And I think there's you could find a fringe case where I would be like, you know. I'm going to play it safe. And I, I would just say I prefer to, to swear on the Constitution. Does anybody oh. have a copy of the Constitution? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really good. That's way, That's a good way to play it. Larry should be my defense attorney. I always said he should be like <laughs> a lawyer in like a Matlock-esque TV yeah. show. Well, I went to college in my to become a lawyer, but I was disillusioned after a while. Give me the Constitution. I love America so much. Right. You can say that on the stand. That's fine. But I think Sarah Silverman has a really neat quote um, about about uh, swearing on the Bible. She's like, you know, when I tell the truth, I tell the truth. I don't put my hand on a book and make a wish. Yeah. And I don't know if this is fair. I, I don't want to make the conversation too awkward, but it would be the equivalent of me like trying to pretend I'm not black while I'm on the stand. Right. And I don't want to hide who I am. And if some people have a problem with that, that's their problem. Their problem. My problem, right? right. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to like go through my life tiptoeing on eggshells. I'm just going to be like, there's pavement right here. I like walking up pavement. If you're an eggshell, that's, that is a you problem sort of thing, not a my problem to make you happy sort of thing. Right. And, and uh, as true it is, is there's nothing wrong being black. There's nothing wrong being an atheist. In fact, I find that the, mo the most intellectually honest position. Specifically, uh -huh. uh, Gnostic atheism. If someone claimed they know that God doesn't exist, I'm going to have just as many questions of them sure. as I would for any right. atheist. Right. But uh, agnostic That's... atheist is like the literal best position to be in. And if you just, if anyone's confused about that, you can have like a one minute diagram session where you just say Gnostic, agnostic atheist, Gnostic, agnostic theist. And they'll be like, that makes yep. sense. <laughs> one's about belief yep. and one's about knowledge. Right, right. right. And they'll be like, oh, I guess I should learn what an atheist is from another atheist rather than just my pastor. Um, Which is another whole topic we could cover someday. Oh, well, where someday. do you get your information about atheism? Mm. Yeah. Hey, we'll go into uh, potentially that and some other issues with law, including custody, familial battles, um, the ownership of morality, but we'll do it after this break. Okay. Larry, Sounds good. Out? Sure. This is the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour on WOZO Radio 103.9 LPFM here in Knoxville, Tennessee. We'll be right back after this short break. Hello, and welcome back to the second half of the Digital Free Thought Radio Hour. I'm Doubter Five, and we're on WOZO Radio 103.9 LPFM here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Let's take just a moment to talk about the Atheist Society of Knoxville. ASK was founded in 2002. We're in our 21st year now and have over a thousand members. We have weekly in-person meetings every Tuesday evening in Knoxville's Old City at Barley's Taproom and Pizzeria. Look for us inside at the high top tables or if it's pretty weather outside on the deck. Um, ask, we 
sorry, if you'd like to join us, email us at askanatheist at knoxvilleatheist.org or letschatse at gmail.com. You can find us online at facebook.com, meetup.com, or knoxvilleatheist.org, which is our website. Or you can just Google Knoxville Atheist. It's just that simple. By the way, if you don't live in Knoxville, you should still go to Meetup and do a search for an atheist group in your town. Don't find one? Start one. Right. Wombat, where do you want to pick up? So I wanted to talk about how this has affected us in the real world. And and by us, I mean us glo like globally, right? But in modern times. So I pulled up some examples of custody and familial law cases where family law cases, including like who can raise a child, right? Uh, what can that be based off of? And normally when I see stuff like this, I like to say like, can the child be raised in a safe environment? Um, is the is the parent capable of uh, raising the child in an environment where they can afford to give the child access to the things they need to, healthcare, uh, food, shelter, the last thing I want to be a considering factor is the parents' atheism or or religious or non-religious belief, honestly. And we've had examples even up to the 90s, late 90s, where um, cases oftentimes in the South, but sometimes even in New York and stuff like that, have ruled against the parent solely based on the fact that they're an atheist. And I just want to cover some of those examples with you. The first one is an example in 1996 from a, ninth, a Texas court. When I say 90s, when I say the 90s, you guys are like, oh, the 90s. But the kids, some of the kids who watch the show are like, wow, was it black and white back then? I'm like, no, no, no. Like Space Jam job. Mm -hmm. First one dropped. It's like, oh, the one with LeBron James? It's like, no, 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 no. Let me show you some cool stuff. Anyway, that was a case in Texas. It ruled that a mother couldn't raise her child after a divorce because of her atheism. It was That was the relevant point to determine the custody. And the court considered that the mother's lack of religious belief was the main factor for deciding that the child's upbringing would have been based on a lack of moral and spiritual development, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, whoa, that's so bizarre. But anyway, that court's decision was later reversed. Larry, what do you think? Yeah, I think I would appeal appealed on the fact that a spiritualism couldn't be proven and ask them to prove it in court. Yeah. Prove in court. That's right. I mean, nice. if they're going to use that to take my child away from me, you darn right I'd carry it on up to the Supreme Court. Yeah, prove in court that this is an actual thing before you can decide that's right. the reason why I can't have my kid, mm -hmm. right? Uh, thankfully, that court's decision was later appealed, uh, reversed and on appeal. And they emphasized that religious beliefs alone should not determine custody arrangements. Can you imagine, though, being 1996 in a Texas court and being like, hey, you can't raise your kid because you don't believe in God? And like, so I don't want to nail my son to a cross. <laughs> like there's not even good examples of fatherhood in the Bible. There's a funny little tangent I want to just go on real quick. I have a friend who's a Christian. I like hanging out with him. He has a daughter. I like hanging out with the, the like the little baby. And one of the things he keeps talking about is like stuff that's in the news. And he'll talk about some pretty harmful things like murders, just openly murders. I, there was this guy who shot like 40 guys in the school. And I don't know why all these serial killers are coming about. And then there was this weird thing with, and he'll talk about, uh, uh, um, I, I don't know if I can say this, I mean, pedophiles. Uh, and I'll be like, oh my gosh, that's terrible. And then I'll be like, what pedophiles, what the hell? And he'd be like, hey, don't curse in front of my daughter. <laughs> you know, like, Oh, I what did I say the P word? He's like, no, you said hell. You can't say hell. I'm like, that's a place from your holy book. He's like, yeah, yeah. but you can't say it from it. I was like, I'll say it. next time I, I'll have an outburst, I'll just be like, oh, pedophiles. And you'll be like, uh, that's much better. <laughs> that is a strange line to draw. Yeah. I like hanging out with him either way. It's great. Yeah. Um, I'm hoping he's enjoying his time in Florida. I don't know if he watches this show. I think I've sent him some links before. Anyway, um, this was a quest that happened in, oh my gosh. 2002 New York case, uh, Ooh, wow. matter of Geeler and Geeler. So a uh, married couple. This is an involved couple going through a divorce in New York. The court considered the mother's atheism and the father's religious beliefs as factors in the custody determination. And the court ultimately granted sole custody to the father, citing concerns that the mother's atheism would negatively affect the children's religious upbringing. Yeah, well, I guess it would. Yes, I mean, would. they have a point there. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> that's well, well well said larry well said larry <laughs> so uh thankfully that one was also uh reversed on appeal due to various procedural errors that were not explicit uh that were not even explicitly on the issue of atheism so she got the appeal on a technicality on that point but that's 2002 what do you think that, that sounds suspiciously like they had to repeal it because or they, they had to uh, overturn it because of her arguments and 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 magic yeah um, but, they didn't want magic, but, but they didn't want to say it they didn't want to right. explicitly say we're 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 overturning this because she's right that religion shouldn't be a factor so they fall on a technicality or that, right I, right i wouldn't right. be too surprised if that's actually what happened it turned out the judge was just two kids in a trench coat that was that. that was, it was like, oh, geez, that happened again. Okay, okay, yeah. fine. We'll reverse that. And the kids were like, we love God. Ah, oh, dang it. Yeah. That's why two voices were coming out of the judge. Anyway, um, I have another case. This is also from 1995, but uh, there's there's several of these. I pulled up a list just using um, Google search, and I found that in New York in 1995, matter of Patricia M., the court considered a mother's atheism as the main factor for determining custody. Uh, the court expressed concerns about the mother's atheist beliefs, suggesting that they could negatively affect the children's moral and spiritual development. However, the decision was eventually overturned on appeal, with the appeal court emphasizing that a parent's religious beliefs should not be the sole basis for custody decisions. So this is something that's been going on for a mm. while. You know, it didn't take me a long time to pull up these examples. And I'm sure it's not just in the area of custody that that this is the only issue. The fact is we have judges who are were okay with this for a period of time and we have to go to an appellate court to reverse it. You know, uh, we have presidents who would probably be okay. We have senators who would probably be okay with these initial decisions. And what is it going to take to change the culture of understanding of re of getting this out? What do you think, Larry? Well, I, I've harped on this many times and you're probably tired of hearing about it, but let's hear I about think it. We, should, we don't we have should... to you know, I was saying they should appeal it uh, on the case of spirituality, but basically they're saying that um, it's morals and right. and um, the truth of the religion, basically. But all right. of it's touted on, uh, it's all built on uh, your soul and where it goes. Right. And there's never been any good evidence that there's a, an actual soul, that it that they exist or anything exists after the person's death. I knew we I were going to get the soul. That should be litigated. We should. Why don't? Well, the thing is, uh, and I, uh, Bujo, tell me if this is true. Is it Sam Harris who says anything that was presented without evidence can be dismissed without evidence? Uh, that, that might be Hitch, but but Hitch. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, it's a classic Hitch. I'm just saying, like, would that motivate anyone to stop believing that conclusion that souls don't exist if we put the matter to court? If someone said, "Hey," That belongs to me because it's my soul and you stole my soul. So you owe me X, Y, Z amount of money. And we prove in court that I can't possibly steal a soul because they don't exist. So I'm, I'm not guilty of stealing someone's soul. Yeah, but it's, it's not so much what verdict the, the court would take, would give on that, but I think it would be the evidence that would be made public throughout the course of the trial oh. because everybody would follow the trial. I mean, it would be one of the most, um, public trials, most followed trials, and all of the evidence that would be brought forth would be digested by a lot of people, and I think okay, that would okay. help the case. So it would need to be like a celebrity sort of thing, where it's like, this guy stole my soul. Tom Cruise stole my soul. <laughs> and people would be yeah. like, I'm taking you to court. And it's just like, the court on mm. the soul. And so right. Tom Cruise is like, I, didn't, I can't steal souls. Yeah. They don't and they would it. show how, how little evidence there is out there for a soul. I mean, there was like Dr. McDougall's uh, soul experiments, but it only had a, like six people that he experimented on and only he had to throw out two of them. And, and the, the, the entire case for the soul was that the body weighs less after you die. And that was not conclusively proven. And even yeah. if it was, it doesn't mean it was a soul. Yeah. And what that a left. thing. You, people don't realize how much your weight fluctuates in the day just from mm -hmm. water right just from drinking yeah. water it, it goes mm -hmm. up my my body weight goes up seven pounds fluctuation just from drinking water i'll wake up and i'll be you know uh 245 by the end of the day i'll be like 252 and i go to sleep and i'll just sweat and i will breathe 
some quick science. Whenever you breathe, there's moisture in your breath. It's mm-hmm. not because you have a wet inside. It's because you're, well, yes, you're breaking down fat. When you break down fat, one of the components is CO2 and water, right? And when you breathe out, you have CO2 in your, in your exhales, but you also have water. That moisture comes from breaking down fat. So you're breaking down matter and you're also letting out water along with gas. All of those have weight and you're doing that all day long. And so you think about that. If you sleep down and just sleep, you're going to be losing body weight just by the fact that you're perspirating, you're exhaling, you're exhaling, you are burning off body heat. There's a bunch of stuff going on. So when a person dies, think about that. It's not just like they're dead. Their body still goes to systematic functions where they're shutting down completely. And so if you wait like with a dead body that recently died another four hours or so, like they might weigh, what was it? The two grams that they said mm-hmm. was less when a body's yeah. less. It's like, and they used like this, how do you this know? T- uh, timber thing in with beams, you know, to weigh an entire body and then determine it was only a couple of ounces on a couple of uh, particular <laughs> cadavers. Yeah. What's I'm, the I've got a, error an on article I, I wrote yeah. on it. It's on my site, digitalfreethought.com. If anybody wants to follow up on it. What is the margin of what's the you were talking about, um, uh, Boudreaux, you were talking about like systematic errors and just how you obtain data. Uh, yeah. What's the yeah. error margin on the test like that? That would be something I'd love to check. Yeah. Out. Or the precision of the instrument or. Uh, yeah. And the sample size in this case is only like three or four people. Yeah. Yeah. Cause of death, you know, would be a factor of that. That's preposterous. Yeah, I didn't, and, I didn't and catching them at the, at the exact moment of death too. I mean, yeah. you can't kill them, so you have to that's determine true. when they actually pass. You know, the type. Well, you shouldn't kill them, Larry. Yeah. <laughs> no, you shouldn't. I did put in the chat for the for the people that might watch this on YouTube and and blast us with comments. It was it was Hitch had said it, and it's called Hitchens Razor. In fact, mm-hmm. okay, nice. Yeah. Asserted without ev- evidence can be dismissed without evidence. Now, here's the other thing that, or here's the other shoot. I would love to see, I'd love to see people be open to the idea of Christianity or being on trial and like listening to the evidence that's presented and being swayed by maybe a lack of evidence. But also, I'd love to just see the stigma of an atheism, an atheist just go away. And I don't think that happens until we have more outspoken atheism by people who aren't motivated to to debate and argue which there is a a, a realm for that like there should yeah. be people having debates and there should be people having arguments but there should also just be car mechanics who are just atheists you know they're an atheist and it's not a big deal and you just do what you got to do and you bring your car to them and you don't say can you please pray to god and fix my car it's like can you please use your engineering talents to like fix my car and they fix the car and you're like hey thanks bill and it's just like and you don't have to say bless you afterwards. You're just like, hey, thanks for fixing my car. You're really smart. And it's like, oh, thanks. I appreciate that. And you just you just go on your own life. And you should be surrounded by people who you don't immediately codify as Christians because you've never experienced other kinds of different cultures. You should be aware that in a melting pot society like the US, there's just different people from different cultures, different societies. Some have religious beliefs that are very different than yours and are still good people. Some don't have any religious be- beliefs at all, and they're still good people good people are everywhere. You don't need your religious beliefs to be a good person. Like if you just had that, if we just had that and people could have the freedom to express themselves religiously or not, but not associate that with the morality or credibility that comes from when you're in court, I think we can come, we can make a lot of standing forward, but we don't do that unless we're open about who we are. Bujo, what do you think? No, I think you're absolutely right. And I know we talked about it before about, you know, coming out as atheist in, in, in the job world, um, can be tough for some people or risky or, or maybe oh, yeah. we even think it's risky. I've, I've gotten a lot better about kind of leading with, with my, my thoughts on, on religion when I meet people now and I'm a lot more uh, uh, brave about it. It's a, it's a weird, weird to use that term, but I think it's I right. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. hear what you're saying. Yeah. And I think that the key thing that, that needs to change is um, getting more secular, atheist, non religious people in in political um spheres That'd that's be nice. i mean that i mean if you think from the top down i mean we've heaven never knows, had any- heaven knows the other side is doing it yeah, <laughs> yeah. the dominionists are, are trying to populate uh, all these offices with with christian believers of a specific type with intent yeah. with intent yeah. with like intent to do that 
that's mm-hmm. the goal for them. They know that affects us. Like have a lot of kids and get your stuff, get your kids in office where they have political yeah. sway and in, in power circles. Yeah. That's um, scary. <laughs> that's not representation. Yeah. yeah. So we've had, we could get rid of a lot of laws. Some laws that we don't follow anymore, but we still have them on books are associated with things like blasphemy and sodomy. Huh. And and we recently passed legislation in Tennessee. Larry, I don't know if you saw this on your last voting that made slavery illegal because we had some like very loose terminology. It was like, slavery is legal unless if, and it was like, there shouldn't be an unless, there shouldn't be a factor statement there. It's like, well, what if they did something really bad? It's like, you should never own a person as property, period. Like, we Well, I mean, it's still going on though in prisons. Uh, yeah. I mean, so you, you, uh, you frame a person to get them in prison and then you work them for no pay. What's the difference? Being owned as property. But uh, we can talk about that a bit more in maybe a different episode. But the idea is the the law was stipulated um, imprisoned ownerships where prisoners would be uh, what kind of prison, what kind of prisoners could be subject to what laws we adhere to them, but not slavery, not slavery. Like there's no excuse to have slaves, period, like indentured servitude. And, and I agree. Employees totally that, agree. Yeah. Like that is. That's something that we should just be against. And then we can talk about everything else afterwards, but like no slavery. And so th- there was some, but blasphemy laws are still on the books, at least in our state. And I don't know if Kentucky has them, but I wouldn't be surprised if they did. Um, I think Kentucky is a little bit more forward on a lot of these aspects, but even in the 20th century, we've had a lot of cases where we try to protect free speech for people who make blasphemous or even offensive statements on religious sensibilities. And um, our courts have ruled for and against in a lot of those cases. And I got another list, but the idea that should free speech cover blasphemy as probably the best in the best sense, or should we have a bit more consideration on how it makes people feel when you blaspheme against their God and, and well, make that illegal? <clears throat> what do you guys think about that? Are we going to outlaw speech based on how it makes people feel? I mean, that's <laughs> that's the, the, the problem, and you know, no, we shouldn't. I mean, blasphemy should not be illegal. I mean, if you uh, praise one god, aren't you blaspheming another? Oh, very good point. Very good point. Very good point. Bujar, what do you think about that? No, I agree. I was I was just quickly trying to look to see if Kentucky had any, and and it's. It's uh, it's a rabbit hole. I, I don't want to get get into yeah. on on the call, but yeah, I almost kind of feel like it's on the level of thought crimes. You know what I mean? It just seems very invisible. You know, invisible harm. Right. Uh, yeah. Just, we yeah. talk. We talk. We have a a global atheist news review that we do sometimes with John Richards, and the idea was is is. He is there a difference between blasphemy and assault? And yet I would say so. I would say like one is me saying something and the other one is me harming a person. And I think those are different things. So like if you say, hey, Ty, I'm going to take your holy book. I'm going to buy 30 copies of it and I'm going to burn it outside in with my friends. I'd be like, well, you that's your property. You can do whatever you want. Thank you for the money. Right. Like that's me in my head. <laughs> <laughs> feel free to come back you're my best customer for this week larry if i wanted to buy 100 copies of your book and burn them in like my garage would you have any umbrance against that or would you no. be like okay Go yeah yeah because in my mind that is a different thing than me harming somebody and i understand the sentiment of why i'm burning a book and i don't necessarily like or agree with that maybe sometimes it makes me feel isolated or vulnerable but as the act of doing whatever you want with your property, I don't care. That's that's why you bought it from me. If you stole a book and burnt my, a book that belonged to me, I would have a problem with that. You you took something from me. But if you legally got it, you could do whatever you want with it. And so in one case, I find free speech to be, I have the ability to um, express myself in a way that doesn't cause any immediate harm to anybody. I should be allowed to do that. Um, it may not make everybody happy, I, and I granted it. It doesn't mean that I'm free of any consequences that might come apart from it. But as far as the act itself being illegal, I think that is uh, a stretch, particularly when it falls to something that we can't demonstrate to have taken any offense to begin with, right? Like if I if I blaspheme the thunder god and a bolt of lightning 
strikes my house, I'd be like, maybe there's something to this. But if I blast from God and like literally nothing happens, I'm just like, maybe God doesn't have a problem with it. So why are you so upset? Like, if I said there's no such thing as a Canadian girlfriend, why are there a bunch of high schoolers <laughs> calling me angrily? He's like, no, it's true. It's true. It's true. He's like, why are you upset? I'm like, this could be, just be my problem. Um, the I know I know there are areas where free speech has its limitations, like, you know, screaming fire and a, a cause inciting a riot sure. or causing like people uh, in a state where people can get hurt. Like, we know there are limitations on it. We know that. Like, I can't say with intent that I'm going to harm someone on the show or face to face, that's a threat. We can we have protections against stuff like that. But if I said I am going to burn a book or buy a flag and burn it, I that that will come with considerations of man, you did a mean or you did a something I really don't approve of. But you have the right to do that. Like mm -hmm. that is a right that we are willing to protect as part of this country to do it, even if we don't agree with it. Which I find makes a lot of the stuff in this country. Um, some of the things I'm proud about, like like the right to have, to have that protest arrest to express yourself, the right to speak freely on stuff like that, like against even powers that might be. Um, what about defamation of character? Um, uh, you know, obviously that you know that there should be some protection against somebody you know saying something well, about yeah. someone. Yeah, libel. Um, and we do. Um, so, uh, and I'm just I'm just trying to stir an argument, really. But I mean, is there can we kind of weasel that into uh, into religious um, uh, 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 point that like if you uh, spoke so bad about someone's God, is that is that, right. you know, God, God is us. We are Jesus. Is there some right, right, definition right. of character claim? I don't know. So I would say have the God send me the uh, court notice. <laughs> exactly. Right. Unless the that guy would be a stretch. Yeah, well, I yeah, mean, personally. if it was a if there was a cult leader who's like, "I am God," and I'd be like, "Okay, at least this is something that we can directly talk to," and I'll be open to that. But if I'm making fun of your, you know, your your holy being, your dead prophet, right? Uh, let the prophet handle it. You know, like don't don't take up arms for that person. And instead, just focus on what you can control in this life. What do you think, Boudreau? I did. I, I, I did uh, hear in the past that. Isaac Hayes <clears throat> left the show South Park because South Park's continuously made fun of Scientology. Scientology. Yeah. He was a Scientologist, but I did recently read, I don't know if it's true or not, that he that that wasn't actually the case. Um he got he got pretty sick, I think, and had to oh, leave the okay. show for that reason. Mm. So I it, it may have been there was some truth in it, not a whole lot of truth, but I mean there, there's someone who you know, seemingly got mad about them making fun of Scientology and and, and maybe in part left left the show kind of, right. you know. No, that's his right. He can't. And, yeah, yeah, it is. And, it's, yeah. and it can be a scary thing, too, is particularly when, like, there's <clears throat> lots of violence in media following any acts of blasphemy, right? And yeah. we've seen that from Christians. We've also seen it from Muslims, too, more famously. But the idea that I am, re we may be hesitant to say something due to clashback from the living bodies who might take advantage vengeance for that doesn't make that God belief any more real. It doesn't make that God any more offended or accurate or, or exist exist existential. It's just, I'm afraid of people who have very low critical thinking capabilities coming after me and cause me harm, but I'm not, doesn't make me any more believing in that God. Right. And I, I, that's the full list. And I think Larry, you hit the nail right on the head where it's like when i sing a song saying god is the only god and he reigns from heaven and earth who sing i was like wait a second you're 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 blaspheming against literally every other pantheon of gods that are out there when you say that one thing he's like god's the only one it's like yeah yeah it makes sense if i can praise my god at the at the at, <laughs> by dissing everyone else isn't that blasphemy in its own right and why is it that it's only when it's against the god of the nation who has the power that we care about it's because there's a racket that's all yep. I'm saying. And 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 it's institutional and yep. it's only something that we can steadily water down as we make more people aware that their God doesn't make them these moral pariah or moral pedestals of perfection. You know, like you can be a good person without your religion. You can be a good person with a different religion and you can be a good person whether you have your religion or not. And so the more we understand that, the less we can have court cases deciding whether we transgress against these gods or if we should have our kids just based on where we're at on our religious spectrum. I think we overstepped one big example, which was this 
is it the Snokes case, the one where evolution was put on trial? Do you guys remember Scope, that? Scopes. Scopes. Uh huh. Here, it's just uh, just south of Knoxville, about sixty minutes in in uh, Dayton, Tennessee. Yeah, Layton. Or I'm sorry, uh, uh, Larry. Would you want to cover that real quick before we head out? Um. Well, this is back in 1925, I think it was that they had a. a Evolution was a big deal in Tennessee, and they were trying to keep it from being taught in schools. Right. So they made it against the law. Uh, and uh, this, this high God. school teacher, huh? Because of God. There was like yeah, yeah. God. They made it, the religious people made it against the law to teach, and, teach it in school. Um, but this teacher wanted to uh, challenge the law. So he made a point. He notified the sheriff that he was going to do it and the powers that be, and they had a photographer there and he started teaching evolution and they arrested him and went to trial. And he, he eventually lost the trial. Of course he'd have to here in Tennessee. Hmm. Um, but he appealed it and uh, never had to pay the fine and was overturned on a technicality later, but there's still a museum in ten, in uh, Dayton, Tennessee that you can go visit any weekday. I think they close it on Saturday, but about a hundred um, miles down from the Ark Museum, Boudreaux, if you play. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. More like 150. <laughs> a little Tennessee, it's, Kentucky low there. Yeah. Uh, the creation <laughs> museum in the Ark. But the courthouse still stands and it's in the basement of the courthouse. Wow. Uh, it's I, I make a like a annual pilgrimage down there on my motorcycle every year. Wow, nice. Yeah. Nice. Cool. Okay. Guys, we're at the end of the show. Well, we still got a bit. It's, yeah, I'm, got, at 50, I'm at 51 minutes, 52. Yeah, that's enough time to plug some stuff and say, hey, everybody, have sure. a good week. Blue Joe, anything okay. to plug for next week? Or uh, um, you check out? Well, I don't have anything like that, but I did want to uh, point out that, that I read this recently, too, that Albania um, is the, the uh, only, at least that I know of, um, atheist state. Ooh, uh, cool. yeah, 1967, they were um, rocking it. The former socialist government declared Albania the, the world's first atheist state. Right, uh, cool. Well, good. And uh, have they had a war or anything since then? No. <laughs> yeah. Well, good job, Albania. That's a new thing yeah. I went to put in my pocket. Yeah. Very uh, cool. Or feather in my hat. Um, my thing would be when you solve car problems, you don't Ooh. you don't open up a Bible. Or I hope you don't. And if you have an engineer who is, get another engineer. But the the idea is like solving problems typically involves understanding what you're working with and looking at it in a very objective co- in a way or very objective context where you don't assume you know what the problem is from the start. You just try to gather clues and try to look at it as objectively as possible. And there's something really rewarding with how we do that and lead to having cars that work that we should learn and apply to other things outside of just car repair. Because I guarantee you there's probably mechanics who are very, very good at being a car repair person, but strongly believe that uh, a piece of text in their Bible is absolutely true just because a pastor said so, or because their parents raised in that particular way. And or so, that the Bible says so. Or that the Bible says face. so. Yeah. But we don't have that standard for when we go to work. When we go to work, we have a different hat on. And so like my main thing is, if if you've ever done car repair, if you ever solved a problem, if you ever like even opened up a key lock or or figured out why a key works or why cars do the, what they do or how to get stronger in the gym, you're you're oftentimes looking at examples that were based on trial and error, figuring out what stuck, and then re- learning from that process and and coming up with better iterations to lead to a better process. That is science, believe it or not. And so whatever your religious circles might have said to take a light off of that. That's the scientific method. And we all participate in it every day, every single time we try to get closer to the truth. And so you don't need to have a dogmatic answer or dogmatic excuse or a different standard to understand what's true or not. You don't need that Bible to figure out what's true. You have all the tools available to you. And you may not get all the answers you want, but sometimes that's good too, because whether, and I'll say this as my final point, like my car repair, I found out that I had an oil leak but, and I didn't want to have an oil leak. <laughs> I didn't want that, but it was the true answer. And now that I know where the oil leak is, I know how to fix it. And so sometimes 
when you look up something, you'll find something uncomfortable and you'll find something that doesn't make you feel happy or something, find something that make you have to do more work afterwards. But that's a good thing because that's what science can help you do. It can show you where you need to fix so you can get better off with the rest of your life. And I found like, that's such a great thing. So use that method all the time because there's no benefit to having a double standard in your life, particularly for something as important as what you think will happen to you, how you'll interact with other people and stuff like that. So that's my, that's my pressing logic. Learn from the methods that you're already using that that's the best standard to address all your questions in life and continue to operate on that single standard. All right, Larry, what do you got? Uh, just the request that if you feel that someone has stolen your soul, oh. be sure to take them to court. There you go. A lot Larry. of people would want to know, you know, if that's a, if that's a thing, because I'm sure they'd want to uh, take their own case to court. So be sure. Um, you can find my my stuff at digitalfreethought.com. Um, and be sure to click on the blog button for radio show archives. Uh, I'm trying to find my text here. As Larry finds it out, I want anyone to sue me that I just taken this the the soul of the Pope and I put it in this container of Tic Tacs. It's in here right now. The the Pope's soul is in this toothpack, the toothpick pack. I Tyrone you should have weighed it first. <laughs> Stolen oh. <laughs> the soul of the Pope and put it in this thing. Feel free to sue me and, and we'll see if we can give it back to him or not. But I am in possession of it now and I stole it. Feel free excellent. to sue me. I admitted that on the show. Yeah, excellent. Well done. Uh, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, you can find my book, Atheism, What's It All About? on Amazon. My YouTube channel handle is at Doubter5. If you're a member of clergy, but have come to see that the claims of religion are not justified and have lost your faith, there's help for you at the Clergy Project. The link is clergyproject.org. And remember, everybody is going to somebody else's hell. The time to worry about it is when they prove that heavens and hells and souls are real. Until then, don't sweat it. Enjoy your life. And we'll see you next Wednesday night at 7 o'clock on WOZO Radio. Say bye, everybody. Bye, bye, everybody. Bye-bye.